Okay, welcome to this virtual presentation of the 2D argument against non-materialism. I am preparing to present this talk at the 10th biennial conference at the Towards the Science of Consciousness conference in Tucson, which is uh, starting tomorrow, actually. So this is a final run-through, if you will. And we only have 15 minutes, so let's go ahead and delve right in. So I think that the standard 2D argument against materialism uh, is at this point pretty well known as developed by David Chalmers. You start with the conceivability of zombies, you infer their possibility, and then to the conclusion that materialism is false. But I want to argue against this way of thinking about things um, by showing that just because one accepts a version of 2D semantics or something like it, it doesn't automatically follow that materialism is false because there's also the perfectly good 2D argument against non-materialism. And that's what I've pressed in some of my other work, um, in particular in my paper, Deprioritizing the a priori arguments against physicalism. So we start by conceiving of a Shambi world, which is a world where there's a duplicate of me and um, which has consciousness but which lacks any non-physical properties. And we can put this for symmetry reasons as saying that we can conceive of a world where not P or Q is true. So of my Shambi twin, it's either not the case that our physics is instantiated in that world or it has consciousness just like me. That's conceivable, so it's possible, and since that's possible, then non-materialism is false. So the argument is valid, it's exactly symmetrical to the zombie argument, and so what I want to do is um, think about some of the consequences of um, this kind of argument. Now, many authors have noted that it's possible you can have this kind of conceivability claim for physicalism, and what they've argued, um, mo for the most part, is that there's a, a you can sever the link between conceivability and possibility, and that's because most of these um, people are empiricists. They don't like the 2D commitment to modal rationalism, um, and I tend to think that that's a plausible way of thinking about this stuff. But what I want to do is grant the connection between conceivability and possibility, um, and, and because this is really an argument that you can have physicalism even if you accept rationalism. So I don't want to take the standard empiricist move. I think it's more interesting to grant the connection between conceivability and possibility. And in particular, what we mean here is ideal conceivability. So if you can conceive of this stuff under ideal conditions when you have all true theories and all empirical facts, then that really does give you um, a way of thinking about what the world could be like. Um, or could have been like, as a matter of fact. So as a brief primer, um, I don't think that you need to accept all of the 2D semantics, the whole theory, to see the point that I'm trying to make. It helps if you do, um, but the point is quite simple. We think about possibilities, and it seems very clear to us that we can imagine two scenarios where there's the same kind of stuff as far as we can tell from the appearances, but which on a molecular or deeper level is different. So we famously can imagine the twin Earth world where water is XYZ um, and a world where water is something else like H2O. And empirical science tells us that the actual world is this way. So what's going on here is we pick this stuff out in a certain way. We find out what that stuff is. And then we say, given that's what it is, it couldn't have been this other stuff because it was this way all along. But there is, of course, a sense, and this is where the two-dimensionalism comes in, where it's kind of contingent or accidental or something like that, that the actual world is the actual world. Because in the space of possible worlds, it seems as though any of those could be the actual world. Um, they aren't, but they could be. So that if the XYZ world were the actual world, then it would be false that water is H2O. And so we can still say that it's a, it's, it's a possibility. There's a real metaphysical possibility that water be XYZ. Not given the way our world is, but if our world um, hadn't been this way, but instead uh, was this other way we would be convinced that water wasn't H2O. So what we have here are two different things, um, a way of picking something out and then what is picked out at a given possible world, and that corresponds roughly to the primary intention, secondary intention kind of distinction. And that's really all that we need in order to build this argument. Um, so what's going on here then? Well, if we take this kind of view, 
um, the two-dimensional arc semantics, and we have some other theoretical constraints which seem reasonable, the whole modal rationalism stuff, then it turns out that chombies and zombies um, seem conceivable to us now, but only one of them is ultimately conceivable in the ideal sense. It can't be the case that both are, uh, because that would mean that both of them are possible, and then you would have all kinds of weird things going on, given these other theoretical commitments. So the argument from, from the 2D physicalist point of view is which one of these is really conceivable, right? People have already said zombies seem conceivable to them. So what we want to know is what about shambies? Are they really conceivable? And um, I think you can make a strong case that they are. Uh, so we have two notions of conceivability that are useful here, uh, developed by David Chalmers and others. So the first is negative conceivability which is just the idea that there's no obvious contradictions. And I think it's pretty clear that there's no obvious contradictions in not P or Q. There may be some subtle contradiction that we may discover later, but as of right now, there's nothing obviously contradictory in the idea of consciousness being physical. Many people think that is true, and they don't think they believe something contradictory. So that's pretty good evidence um, that there's nothing obviously contradictory there. And I think it's important to note at this point that even if we never could in principle understand how consciousness could be physical, we can still negatively conceive of shambies uh, because we, it's, it's clear that we can conceive of things that we don't know how they could be the way they are. So here's a very famous example. Um, it seems conceivably true that there would be something which is true but that which no one could know. So uh, you can't know what that truth is because you're conceiving of an unknowable truth. So we can conceive of things that we don't know how they could be true or how the, exactly the world would be given that they were true. And I think that we can use that lesson and apply it here, even if we don't understand how consciousness can be physical, uh, it follows, it doesn't follow that we can't conceive of consciousness being physical. I think we can. Um, but of course, the more interesting notion here is positive conceivability, which involves something more demanding, not merely no obvious um, um, contradictions, but somehow picturing or providing an, an account of how the thing in question could be true. And I think that we can make a strong case for this being possible. Now, how would you do that? Well, if you're buying the 2D semantics, well, then you treat consciousness just like water um, and H2O. And what we learn from the standard 2D analysis of this stuff is that these kind of a posteriori identities in the Kripke speak turn out to have primary intentions, which are contingent because they pick out different things in different possible worlds. Um, but their secondary intentions are necessary because given what they pick out in a given world, it has to be that in that world. So if that were true, then we would have um, a way of treating consciousness in a 2D framework. And what's interesting, and this is something which I have tried to argue for in other places, but don't have time to really expand on here, is that the higher order theory of consciousness fits this model very nicely. Um, we can think of the transitivity principle or something like it as giving us the primary intention of consciousness. A consciousness just is um, a state of being aware of oneself as being in some other kinds of states. And then we go and look for what that actually picks out in the physical world. Uh, if it picks out something in the brain, then that thing would be necessarily so uh, set from the secondary position, even though you could imagine the primary intention picking something out, something else out at various other worlds. And if that were the case, then it would be an empirical discovery that consciousness is physical. And um, that would be to say that you can imagine someone becoming convinced that the world they lived in was a world where consciousness is physical. So that, I think, is the 2D argument against non-materialism. Um, shambies are conceivable in the negative and positive sense, and that's a much stronger sense than zombies are. So I think that uh, either uh, you recognize that there's kind of an impasse here and that the a priori arguments are kind of useless, or um, you recognize that we have more reason to believe that uh, consciousness is physical from a 2D perspective. Now, there are objections, of course, and in the last five minutes of the talk, let me go through a couple of the more 
often heard objection. So the first comes from Chalmers himself. He talks about a view like the one I'm talking about in the 2D argument against materialism paper of his. And he says, look, you know, this kind of move requires conceiving of a necessary truth being possibly true, something we could represent as this, that the claim that Shambis are um, uh, conceivable is the claim that it's possible that some necessary truth is true. I agree that this is a very bad and dubious method um, and we don't want to have an argument which employs something like an ontological strategy and I think it's very mysterious how we could conceive of the whole space of possible worlds so I'm not making that move here. Uh, in fact I'm making a different move. So it seems to me that um, Historically, we discovered that identities are necessary. The early identity theorists couched their theories in terms of contingent identities. Kripke comes along and gives his famous arguments um, that identities are necessary. And so we discovered, after more reflection, that identities are necessary. But that doesn't stop us from talking about identities, even though we don't know all their properties. So I think what's going on here is you just conceive of a possible world where consciousness is physical, and then it's a second step from there to the claim that that's necessarily so. Um, so for instance, in this argument up here, uh, the first premise says if two things are identical, then if one has the property of being F, so does the other. The second premise says, oh, and it's for every kind of object out there, it's necessary that that thing is the same as itself. And then you get three, which is an instance of one where the um, um, self-identity thing has been in there. So if X is equal to Y, then if X is self-identical to itself, then what X is identical to Y, and that's necessarily so. Um, and you can conclude from that that um, if X is identical to Y, then it's necessary that X is identical to Y. Now, I think really good evidence that what's going on here is a second move is that you can have people come and question this argument by objecting to premise two and denying that everything is self-identical. And if you make that move, then it's not going to be the case that it's necessary um, that if X is equal to Y, that they're necessarily identical. So um, you can have people who accept contingent identities. They're still out there. They have to say some strange things, um, but they are perfectly willing to say them. And so I don't think we're making this move in the Shambi argument. I think this objection is interesting but misguided. So then the final objection that I'll close here with is, look, someone could say, oh, come on, we already know which one is conceivable. It's zombies, because David Chalmers wrote his book in 1996, uh, <clears throat> and you're just talking about this now in 2012. So zombies have already been conceived, so there's no question about whether zombies are conceivable. But this seems to me like an accidental, historical kind of thing um, that zombies were pointed out first because shambies have been um uh, are equally conceivable and so what i submit here is that there's a kind of background theoretical commitment which is guiding one's intuitions about whether zombies are conceivable or not so they're only going to be conceivable if you hold fixed this constellation of background theoretical commitments um which we could sum up under the name of modal rationalism. So if you have that background view, then zombies are going to seem conceivable to you. And now that's not the only background view on which they're conceivable, but it certainly seems to me that um, if you start out believing they're conceivable and change some of those background theoretical commitments, you might experience it as on further reflection, coming to see that those things aren't actually conceivable in the first place. And all that has changed is some background theoretical commitment. So it seems to me the most reasonable explanation for what's going on here, uh, why some people believe zombies are very much conceivable, and other believe people believe zombies are very much conceivable, is that there's this background of theoretical commitments, which is allowing that. And you change those and you change the conceivability of these. And I think that's a common experience that people have as they come to develop um, their theoretical commitments over the course of doing philosophy. So in conclusion then, it seems to me that we ought to deprioritize the a priori arguments, by which I mean we should set them back because they're not useful. We don't know which is which yet. Um, and in fact, um, even though we can know in principle which is which, what we need is more empirical data. So what the right thing to do now is set aside the a priori arguments and focus on specific theories of consciousness and how viable they are. So in my opinion, the higher order theory of consciousness, perhaps 
the air theory, perhaps some first order theories, perhaps the um, uh, information integration theory. The focus should be on empirical results. Global workspace theory, for instance, comes to mind. Uh, empirical results and how they reflect on these theories and which fits best with a 2D model, in my opinion, is the higher order theory. So that should be a top contender. And I've argued elsewhere, I won't, I don't have time now because I must end, um, but I've argued elsewhere that we have excellent empirical evidence for the higher order theory. So it seems to me that all together, taken all together, that we have very good reason to think that if you adopt a 2D version of semantics, um, you ought to be a physicalist. Thank you very much.